I know that you're a big whiskey guy, but I also know that it's 11 in the morning, right, for you? Yes. Well, as they say, it's 5 o'clock somewhere. It's 5 o'clock right here. So I'm going to have Amen. myself some Jameson. Ah, oh, there you go. Bless you. <laughs> because that's the professional thing to do, right? That's what journalists do. They drink on the job. Yes. Well, when, <laughs> when the guest is me, it's always appropriate. So tell me how you are coping with life post WWE and life in this crazy world right now. Uh, man, I mean, it's just, it's, I, I tell everyone, uh, it's just, it's a crazy thing of like one day blending all the memes, all the jokes you see on the internet are, are true. Like I, one day bleeds into the other. I forget what a weekend is like. Um, even before everything happened, just as the cities and especially here in Chicago, we locked down pretty early. It did. It was hard to just kind of tell one thing to the next. I'm just trying not to climb the walls, keep myself busy and, uh, you know, stay active. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult to stay active though. Like I see a lot of people out like, or even I think staying active isn't so difficult, but I think that like staying fit is difficult. Like I see a lot of people sure. out running, but then they've got like, if they run for an hour, they've 23 other hours in the day to, to fill with what's likely going to be like we're having right now, some, some whiskey or some, some whatever else they're, they're indulging in. So it's like, it's a difficult time for people. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, finding like that, I know for a lot of people that looseness of not having your day like up, breakfast, you know, work. Then after work, you know, you, you pick up the kids or you do this or whatever. Mm -hmm. People not, when you don't, when you lose that, it all, it, like, it's like orbit just breaks and all of a sudden everything is just flying. It's chaos. So that's actually been key to me is just trying to input some sort of structure of my own of my own device in there. So it's like getting up at the same time every day, getting my workout in, I eat breakfast, I can walk the dog, certain, certain activities I do, I have to plan at certain times just to give myself some semblance of structure. Obviously you are in a household where leaving WWE has happened before. You've been through it. Obviously it was a different time with, with your wife, but has she sort of, has she been like the right person to, to have around during a time like this? I mean, she, she understands the feeling and everything. I mean, she's phenomenal just because she understands that that's this crazy business. I mean, just in general, obviously, yeah. you know, it's been around her whole life. So, and so to have someone who not only understands it in general, but you've gone through the same things, 100% couldn't ask for a better support system. I've been speaking to some comedians uh, on my, my Instagram live show, and they've been telling me that they're taking bookings now for, you know, that, like I, I saw a guy going to St. Louis to do a show in Arizona. They're, they're opening things up. What is it like for professional wrestlers? Are indie promoters reaching out to you? So I haven't, I, people have hundred percent, but I haven't gotten anything like solid yet. I've had a, yeah. a lot of like, Hey, we're looking to run a show maybe in like September or mm -hmm. something like that, or we're trying to do this. A couple of international promoters, too, same thing. We're looking to do November, maybe December even. Uh, I think the tough thing is a lot of wrestling, it's even at the independent level, you know, some are a couple hundred people, and gatherings like that, even in the states that are open up, are still under a lot of scrutiny. We're still under a lot of uh, restriction and stuff like that. So, I mean, unless you're having – wrestling events with the you know less than 10 12 people <laughs> yeah which god i've done that and i don't want to sure do um uh i think it's tough for a lot of promoters to plan even in, like even in states that are open up to really figure out when their show is going to be able to have a full audience again um so talk to me about how things went down when you did leave you know we're going Backwards, I, I would like to start from the start, but I'm, I'm going to go in a crazy order in terms of the chronology of this thing. But talk to me about, you know, how it went. I understand that you guys got sent a video from, from Mr. McMahon and, you know, explaining the situation because people have been giving out about the, the fact that people were let go during this pandemic. But businesses across the board are letting people go. And, like, the amount that they were cutting was, was a big deal. What was it like for you being, being someone in that position? Yeah, I mean, it's... It was a really hard day. I mean, it was hard to watch, like, my whole work family be affected by that. Yeah. And, and I, I said, I posted it in my own, my own video, like, it's not, it was a huge swath of, of not only talent and the names you see on all these wrestling websites and everything, but there were a ton of people at, at our corporate headquarters who make the yeah. wheels run, who make the system turn, um, that were affected too. And that, that's just, and even, our company is just a microcosm of what's going on, just as you said, around the whole world, uh, corporately, everywhere. So it was just, 
it was like this snowball effect of like, you hear the announcement, oh, we're going to get an announcement from the chairman. He's talking <laughs> about how the cuts we're going to have to get. Okay. Then you start hearing about like the first release. Then you start hearing about some more of your friends. Then you hear about, again, everybody at headquarters. And it was just like this tumbling effect. And it was just, it was a really, really hard day for everybody. Have you been watching wrestling since? Uh, I keep up with it. I mean, I still have my WWE Network subscription. <laughs> they didn't bin you off of that like they did with Cody Rhodes? Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> well, maybe we shouldn't say that. I don't yeah. want to be talking about um, So, like, I don't have standard television, so I can't tune into, like, the, the main shows as they air, like, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But I'll keep up with them because all my, my friends are still there. I've still got so many so many really, really good friends who are there. And so, uh, of course, and if I, I feel like it's important to keep up with the wrestling world in general. If, you, if you're in the business, you yeah. should know the business. I mean, obviously it is difficult for shows. I like that AEW have the fans, or at least they have fake fans, like the, the wrestlers go out and pretend and WWE brought that in on Monday night. Did you see the show on Monday night? Do you think that it, like, I feel like UFC can get away with it because the results are, like so important, the performances don't matter. If someone gets knocked out in 10 seconds, you know, that's good. Like that's a good thing. Whereas if a wrestling match goes 10 seconds, likely hood is you've done something wrong. Um, have, like, do you find that the, the crowds are, are kind of a necessity? I mean, I, I, in general, when just speaking like philosophically about professional wrestling and sports entertainment, like, yeah, in a way, uh, I mean, the crowd, that they're essential to what we do. We're telling, like you said, this isn't just about, this isn't just a shoot thing about trying yeah. to knock someone out, trying to win. We're, we're trying to tell a story. We're trying to create drama and all this stuff in a physical form. And so to have the audience go on that ride with you, and especially our audiences who get so involved with chants and characters and all this stuff, um, that, that to me hopefully will have to come back. So we are, it's mainly, you know, it's all about television now, especially for the yeah. big companies. So, but having that live energy in the crowd and you can see it when you watch the shows, there's definitely uh, an effect there. And so even, even if it is other talent or whatever it is, I think, I think it helps the atmosphere. Uh, you, uh, this is a kind of a hack question to ask when you're coming from Ireland. It's like, Oh, how great are these Irish crowds? Blah, blah, blah. But you did seem to have a particularly, I remember going to one of the shows where, where you were with Rusev uh, or, or maybe you were on your own. I can't remember, but you were singing your way to, to the ring in the three arena in Dublin. I think I might have gone to one in Belfast as well. And it seemed like you did enjoy those European tours a, a particularly great amount because, you know, you're, you're a cultured guy and uh, you got to kind of show that a little bit. Abs oh, my God. I was just saying that yesterday to someone. I love those European, those tours. They, there are some, I mean, don't, I, I love our fans here in the U.S. and everything, but there are some in Ireland, England, um, Chile, Argentina, like just anytime we got to go overseas, the crowds there are just so awesome. Um, but I do have a special love uh, for Ireland with my mother's whole side of the family. It was 100% uh, Irish and everything like that. So I've got a lot of pride and, uh, and love for especially, especially Ireland. And you had a great line about, uh, about James Joyce, wasn't that right? <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> I, I don't remember what uh, I was doing. I think I was, cause I was doing the Shakespeare song thing. So I think it was on my own. I was doing the Shakespeare song, such and such and such. And I think I called myself the James Joyce of something. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember because, um, because we, what me and my friends would do is I would get, as a media member, they would give us the, the comp tickets. So my friends would decide that, you know, a ticket is what, like 40 bucks, 50 bucks. Like, we, we're not just going to like not spend that 50 bucks. We would go out drinking before all day and then go to the, the WWE live event in the three arena. And, uh, and it would be incredible. And, I, and that's why I don't remember the exact line. Because we were so <laughs> we were so twisted, and you guys were the heels, you guys were the bad guys, and we were not supposed to be. Because like it's a very young audience at these shows. Like it was mostly yeah. children we were around, which is a weird place to be drinking. And uh, and there, there was and like the people were booing you guys, and we were cheering, we were singing along with every word, and we were singing the drama king. It was it was a, it was an incredible night. Oh, it's a it's a blast. I mean, those, those like you said, especially I, I, just in general, the live events. And I tell this to yeah. everyone: if you're watching and you click on this for some reason, you're not a huge wrestling fan. <laughs> go when you're able and it's safe, and then go to a live event. I'm not talking about TV or pay per views, but those live events are so much fun. Like I don't care who you oh, are, you bro. have a good time. They're just 
the, the, there's more time for interaction. It's a little bit more low key and the guys just have a, a blast. And so I, I think audiences, those are the best shows to me. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely, I've been to a few of the TV tapings. I've been to a couple of summer slams and, and for sure those, those little, like the, the house shows in, in Dublin there, we had some special nights at those. I, I was at the, the last one I went to was, I think the last European tour in November, right? Right before I, uh, I was supposed to move to America and that I did move for a little bit, but now I'm, I'm back in Ireland for a bit, but it was like one of my last nights out before. And we had, uh, myself, and my friends had a pretty legendary night going to see all the, the WWE superstars in action. And like I said, it is a we- like it can be weird at times, like indie shows, it's all adults. So it's cool. Like everyone's drinking, everyone's having a good time. Those, the live events, it, it must be difficult for you to have to, to work in front of like audiences that are in some places, like really, really rabid, like in, in a, a Philadelphia, New York, where like people, you know, they know their stuff. And then you go to these live events and it's like all children. Oh yeah. So like that, I mean, and that is one of the keys to being a real pro in this business. And they, mm-hmm. they, they say it all the time. They're like, look, every audience is going to be different. You know? So like you, what works in what you just said works in Philly isn't going to work in Abilene, Texas, yeah. which isn't going to work in Tokyo, Japan. You know what I mean? It's, it's two totally different audience. It's like, that's one of my favorite things. So in, in New York, they're going to love, they're going to be a lot more hardcore wrestling fans. They're going to want fast paced action, all about technical wrestling, great high spots, stuff like that. Maybe in the middle of Texas where it's just a lot of families, maybe they just turn it on a couple times a year. They like the wrestling show. It's maybe it's more like comedy, right? Cause yeah. it's the kids in the audience stuff. So you, you do it, you have a little bit more fun. you just chants back and forth. And then you get in Japan where they just want to watch two big, you know, American guys clash into each other like Andre the Giant and Giant yeah. Gonzalez. And they just, they erupt on that stuff. So you kind of have to adapt to every place you go. Can you tell me how difficult those eight man, those, those fatal four way tag team matches are to do? Cause those were all the matches I ever saw you in when I was at, at live events was you and Rusev for the tag team titles against the new day. I, I want to say the Hardy boys and maybe Seamus and Cesaro. I think, I think I remember the time we came. I want to say it was probably during the time it was probably New Day, Usos, Usos, yeah, us, maybe like Gable and uh, Benjamin. Oh wow! We were doing yeah. a bunch of four ways for like a couple of months there. Yeah, um, Gable wasn't but, with uh, wasn't with Bobby Roode by then, no. Mm-mm. No, yeah, no. but it was. But those matches look really difficult to work. Like, even though they're, they're a lot of fun and stuff, but, like, you've got eight guys who have to get their, their stuff in in front of that crowd. Yeah, it's, it, it is hard. Like, those live events are better because, like you said, they give you a little bit more time. Try doing those on television when you have, you know, four minutes and a commercial yeah, no. break or something like that. It's, it's crazy. But, uh, no, they are because you got to get eight guys on the same page. Um, but, it, honestly, like, with the guys I was just naming, it was so easy. You know, the first time you ever do it, you, you got you kind of work. You got to work out. You got to sit down and figure things out. But like with guys like that, the, you do it once, and then it's like, okay, we got this, and you can switch things around. Like, hey, remember how we started that last time? Let's finish it like that this time. And that that's where you can just kind of improv stuff because you know each other yeah. so well. You were a singles guy when you came in. You were the drama king in NXT, and then you were tag teams pretty much from from there on out, with a few exceptions until you were were commentating. You were with obviously Simon Gotch in the Vaude Villains, and then with Rusev. Now, do you want to pursue singles, or do you and do you and Miro want to do stuff on the independent scene as the two of you again? I mean, it was a crime that you two were never given were never given titles at any stage. I mean, I thought it was totally ludicrous. I think was there there was a pay per view right at the end of the year, a couple of years back. I want to say 2018 or 17 and you guys were, were wrestling for the, the titles and I thought it was it was a, a sure thing that you and Rusev would be tag champs are you and are you and Rusev going to be or you and Miro going to be tag teaming on the indies or are you going to be pursuing a singles career I mean I say why not both you know um, yeah. I think there's room depending on the show depending on the venue for 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 both because mostly obviously I'm everyone you got to take on a look out for yourself so I've got plans for myself and everything but I, I texted, we texted each other on the, on the day it all happened. Yeah. And we're like, hey, you know, hey, thank you for everything, first of all. And then, hey, Rusev Day, independent world tour. And we both said, sure. So we're, we're, we are both uh, open to the idea. So when things get going again, you can see us pop up anywhere. 
the person who was, I think, with all due respect to, to you and Miro, I think one someone who really did add a lot to that dynamic was as well Lana. And I know that when I met her last year, I, you know, like, cause like if I'm being my, if I'm letting my inner misogynist out, I so, kind of saw like what she does. And I was like, I was like, you know, Rusev's the funny guy. She's like the hot girl that hangs out with him. And when I met her, I was stunned at how clever she is and how, you know, and I probably shouldn't have been, but I like, I was like taken aback by how witty she is and how quick she is at responding. And he's so funny. And so are you that like, she can keep up. Like she's, got the comedic chops in that department i think she's gonna be she's gonna be missed i think if, if you guys do tag out in the road in the indies yeah no i mean she she added a, a definitely a nice a different flavor to it and everything and she is she's and she's got a great background in performing she's been acting and stuff too before, prior to wwe so uh so it was fun having her it was like this whole little like rusev day family thing yeah and no it was definitely uh it was a great time but i also did really love the vaude villains however I liked you individually and Simon Gotch individually. I'm not sure that, that the, the team was, was always the right thing, especially on the main roster. Would you agree with that? Or do you think that you guys maybe didn't live up to the potential that there was? Oh, I mean, I think it's, it's always tough. Every, and every year for a long time, it was always, you know, it's who, who's coming up from NXT, right? That's always the big question. And then the question after that is who's, you know, there was always kind of a hit or miss thing with a lot of the talent come there who's going to be kind of embraced and who's going to have a harder time adjusting or translating as it were because that nxt audience especially at the time when we were all kind of rising up at the beginning of that whole rise it's such a unique audience you know that that and it was it's very hardcore fans they love very creative and weird and off the wall things yeah. they, like they appreciated it it's almost like art house cinema like they just like they love the out there creative things whereas any which way you throw it, the main WWE audience that has, you know, that's, we've, we've been on television there for 25 whatever years that uh, they, they know what they know. And so, like, when you bring in some of these more unique and very specific yeah. characters, that audience is just way more broad. Like you said, there's a lot of there's any of children to grandparents who have been watching the, the, since Buddy Rogers. And it was definitely so, more of like an 80s style gimmick. Like, it wasn't, you know, people... It, it wasn't like the kind of things that people put on TV in, in whatever it was, 2016. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look at look at all the talent that did really was doing really cool things in NXT at the time. I mean, you had you had us, you had Tyler Breeze, you had CJ Parker, you had the Ascension, you had Adam Rose, you had the in uh, before that he was Leo Kruger. All these yeah. really cool, they were interesting and creative, and the NXT audience loved that. And I think when we went came to the main roster, do I think that we could have change some people's minds or appeal to a broader thing. I think with some, a little bit of elbow grease and a little bit more creative um, direction, some, whether it was vignettes or different promos and stuff, I think we, I think it could have worked a little bit better, but at the end of the day, that audience, like I said, is so broad and maybe just didn't latch on to the very specific idea that was the Vaude Villains. I'm not super deep into like wrestling fandom. I do read some stuff online and all that. And I do know that Simon Gotch had, outside of the business like in like the dave Meltzers of the world and the the dirt sheets of the world he had a reputation for being like a difficult guy did you find him difficult or no i mean we we just we were like that tag team that uh we, we always say and you hear a lot of people say this there's two you're either really your best buds kind of thing you're riding yep. together sharing rooms and all this stuff or a lot of the time tag teams are just they're not very close and we weren't yeah. very close but we had a great professional relationship uh, you know, we got, got done what we needed to get done. We just didn't hang out a lot outside of that. So we didn't have a ton of interaction outside of work and work for the most part was fine. Um, and that's why you take a lot of what you read on the dirt sheets with a grain of salt. Yeah, for sure. Cause I definitely, like I've, I've listened to him speak. I've not met him, but I think like personally, I was always a huge fan of him. When you guys were in a team, I always thought like both of you could do great things. Singles. Like I thought that you guys could, could really show yourselves more as, as, you know, Aiden English and Simon Gotch as opposed to as the vaude villains. And I definitely think that like a lot of the stuff that, that's said about him, it just like, it just seems to me like he, like nobody, nobody in the business ever seems to say that stuff. It's always like secondhand, thirdhand reports, uh, except for like well, Enzo Amore. I haven't heard a single person actually like talk shit about him. Yeah. I mean, then um, there's always someone you don't get along with. And I, mm -hmm. admittedly those two were a little bit like <laughs> oil and water. They were just, that was just a clash. 
Ladies and you knew it at the time, or did it only like sort of come to the boy like when no, obviously of things are happening outside? We, we wrestled them so many times. Like I, there was obviously you can just tell like there was not there was no like incidents or anything like specific yeah. like that. Um, Except for but payback. you can you can just tell when things like it's hard to make yeah. things like, like me and me and Big Cass for example. Bessie, we, we could gel, baby. I could, I could I could do anything with him any day of the week. Um, and I and I worked well with Enzo too, but uh, yeah, just, those two they, they just clashed on a lot of ideas. Whether it was just how the match was going to go, or just personal, the the way they the way they are. So they're both very strong personalities, and that so that'll end up happening. Bro, of course, and especially because it's such a physical business, and it's like it's right on the the edge. Like if you really really hated someone, you could hurt them badly in in a, a wrestling match if you wanted to, and that's and there's For a lot sure. of trust involved. So it's like. It, I get that there's like they might have hated each other, but they they also showed you know great restraint because obviously the incident at the pay per view aside, like you know that they they always had like you guys always had good matches with with Enzo and Cass. Yeah, I mean that, and that's the thing when you're I don't care who you are when you're in this business. I I have not met, and look, God, unless I'm forgetting some huge blind spot, I have not met anyone who would who would actually want to go out and like hurt someone and take those liberties. You hear stories yeah. about the old days and stuff like that. But I, in my time in this business, have never come across someone with that much, like, mal, you know, intent and everything well, like that. Well, you would have to hate, you'd have to hate the person you're hurting more than you love your own career. Oh, 100%. Because any, anybody, anybody who gets a whiff of that is, you're, you are, you're done. you know, you're done. For, with, there's, it's a brotherhood in the locker room. So if anybody knows you to do anything like that, you have, your reputation is, is shattered. Is there anyone in the locker room you're looking forward to working with again? Like, obviously, like you said, you don't get a huge amount of time to really, like, delve into a match with a Zack Ryder or a Kurt August, people like that. And, you know, like, now you've got the opportunity on the indie scene to, to get in there with a lot of great guys. Is there anyone you're really looking forward to showing what you can do with? I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot. I mean, I've, I'm going to start with, like, my favorite. I think my favorite opponent I've ever had, uh, and that's, that's Sean Spears. Uh, we did, there was, if there was a missed opportunity in WWE, there, I think there was a huge one there between the two of us because we were married on live events for a long time and we had such good matches and such good chemistry and he is such a good dude. Um, I love him to death. Is, and sorry, so, is that the match I'm thinking of where it was a fatal four-way with Rusev for the US title and you were in his corner maybe? Because I remember, perhaps, I remember him being um, in that match. Ty Dillinger, right? That I don't remember any matches with that. I just I just remember wrestling Ty Dillinger on, yeah. one on one a lot. Yeah, yeah, but he was he was a great uh, like everyone says that he's in terms of workers probably one of the best around. One one of the best, hands down. And I mean, and just uh, a pro from start to finish, and and a great guy. And like <clears throat> I don't know, like I can't say enough good things about him. And we had such good chemistry. I want to take that. I, I would love to show that to the world. Uh, on, a, on a larger scale, but there's guys too. Like one of my best buddies that that I miss uh, is uh, Juice Robinson, who was yeah. CJ Parker in NXT. He's now he's he's over killing it in Japan. So be, have the opportunity to go over there and work with him, dude. I, I was training with him back when NXT was FCW, yeah. and uh, so I got a long history with him. He's one of my he's one of my dudes. And the other one that I that I wish I would have wrestled more is uh, Pac. So oh, uh, we had a couple uh, Neville. Of great, yeah. Yep. We had a couple of uh again just slivers of things. We had a couple of house show matches in NXT and FCW and uh he was just such a pleasure to to work, such a breeze uh to work. But there's I mean I could make a whole Cody Rhodes list if I wanted to <laughs> yeah. of all the people <laughs> I want to work and maybe particularly now, right? Like because there's so yeah. many new people on the indie scene. Yeah, no kidding. It's like, it's like this whole I don't want to call it rebuilding because it's always changing, but like mm -hmm. since NXT is kind of and AEW and everything have kind of hired a lot of these huge standouts from the independent scene, you know, we got, you got to keep making more. And that's what I love about this business. Just when one, you know, wheel moves off, a new one comes on and stars are made. Well, what I recall is the same people that were giving out about the amount of people released that day, a couple of weeks ago is those same people were complaining about how WWE go to the Indies. Like about six months ago, and now yeah. they're now they're giving up because they they get to see all these matches that they wanted to have yeah. so badly. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely think that um there is 
I definitely think there's huge opportunity in, in wrestling, sort of once things get back to normal for a lot of guys. But it's also going to be a more difficult landscape for you than probably it was for, let's say, you know, Cody Rhodes or, you know, Damian Sanda when, when they would have got released because there's, there's a huge, uh, there's a lot of people in the market right now. Yeah, I mean, well, so like, I don't, I don't worry about that so much. I mean, more like you just said, the more talent, the better. I mean, and there are a lot of promotions, and yeah. I, I feel like independence, at least before all of this in the world, what, they, were, they were all popping up all over the place. And between domestically here and internationally, there's so many promotions, so many places to work now. And there's even, I mean, there's more companies with AEW, with Ring of Honor, with uh, Impact, New Japan, you know all this stuff going on in Mexico and I mean, there, there's a lot of like major, you know, television promotions and things like that. So the opportunity, I think there's plenty for everybody. I'm not worried about like a flooded marketplace. Uh, I just hope we can get back to a place where we can have shit like we seen at the beginning, having shows with, with yeah. significant crowds. Cause that's, that's the lifeblood of what we do. Yeah. And no, I think, and, and it's so important for professional wrestling to have the, the audience interaction, particularly on the indies when like, those crowds, especially now, are so hot. Like, you know, you go to an OTT in Dublin or a, a Pro Wrestling Gorilla in, in the States or Progress in the UK. You know, there's, like, the, the crowds are what make these shows. You know, the work is great, but you can kind of see that anywhere. But, you know, in the indie scene, the, the crowds are a huge part. But you strike me as a guy who likes the idea of going to Japan. I mean, well, I mean, I like to go, go to Japan just to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. I mean, no offense, New, New Japan Pro Wrestling aside, <laughs> uh, in my time with WWE touring Japan outside of my home of Chicago, Illinois, like Tokyo, Japan is my favorite place on planet earth. Um, I, I fell in love so hard with that country, with that city in particular, but this, that whole, that whole country. I love like just their way of life, their sensibility. I love the people there. Uh, food is incredible. Yeah. Um, but, but hell yeah, I would love the opportunity to go to Japan and, um, and as much as possible, because again, I love the country. And then now bring back in a company like a new Japan pro wrestling and all the promotions they have over there. Uh, great fans who really appreciate the art and the sport of what we do. You of course started training in, in FCW with like beginners classes, right? So like your first experience of pro wrestling was something like the WWE style. Is that correct? Yeah. So, uh, uh, when I was looking to wrestle, so I, I wanted to go right out of high school, I remember. And my parents, that was their one thing. They were super supportive, but their one yeah. caveat was, please just go to university. You know what I mean? I don't, like, I don't care what for, just get a degree and then do whatever the hell you want. Tell parents so tend to I went, be. I got the same one. Yeah. They, they made me go to university too. <laughs> it worked yeah. out okay. Journalism worked yeah, out all right. absolutely. So I went and got the most useless degree I could in theater <laughs> and um, – and uh, use that to kind of help hone characters and stuff. But when I was looking to train, at least at the time in Chicago, the schools around here were not, no, no, nothing notable, nothing very uh, reputable at the time. Uh, now there's some things a lot better. But so I knew FCW was like the developmental ground for, for yeah. WWE. I knew that much. And so I looked on their website and saw that they offered a, a training beginners class, you know, two or three nights a week. And they did that a few times a year and found out it was Steve Kern's little uh, pet kind of pet project on the side. So I said, screw it. I saved up my money, uh, yep. moved, grabbed a duffel bag, moved into a stranger's house that I got off <laughs> Craigslist um, and, and moved to Tampa for a couple months and trained under, it was Norman Smiley who mainly taught Legend. the classes at the time. Oh my God. Incredible. What a, what a guy like, the reason I asked was because you've obviously trained with, you've lived with, you've been around, you've worked with people who've done the new Japan thing. They've done, they've been in Japan for years. You know, do you think based on the work that you've done, the training you've done that you would be able to work that style? I mean, look, you, you've seen my character. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a singing, dancing ass over tea kettle kind of <laughs> i can be a silly wrestler um i think it would be fun challenge but you can honestly. fucking go too when you want oh, to I like can in, go. in yeah in, in nxt i don't, saw it for sure the world get me wrong. i can go uh so but as much as i can it would be it would be a little i'm not even gonna lie it would be a little intimidating but it would be a, such a fun challenge 
and to go over there and test myself against some of the best professional wrestlers in the world. I wholeheartedly believe that are right there, are there right now. And so to test my medal against some of those guys would be incredible. It would be an honor and it would be a privilege. I mean, it definitely, it definitely is very different to what you've been used to for the last, whatever, like what, like 10 years you've been around sort of FCW, WWE. Almost. I mean, it's for sure. It's a, uh, it's on the different, but you, but you've been around guys who've been through it. Right. And I'd imagine that if you, I'd imagine you, you would know if you couldn't do it. Yeah, no. I mean, like you said, getting to work with some guys, getting to work with a guy like Neville Pac, mm-hmm. um, and having matches and getting, even I even got to work with uh, Kenta a few times. So just having, and they adapted their styles to America, of course, but just getting a little taste of like, oh, this is, oh, God, when he, when he kicks, yeah. he kicks. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, and, uh, working a couple of those styles, you know, working that into some of our matches, it gave me a little taste. And it was like, ooh, like that's, that is tough, but that is, that is fun. That, that lights you up. And so like, that would be, that would be fun. I, and I do, I do know I could do it. Could you talk me through what it's like being in one of those WrestleMania big battle Royals with 30 people in the ring at one time? It sounds to it seems to me like behind the scenes, whenever I watch these things, I watch them sometimes because I always watch WrestleMania with like people who don't really know wrestling, right? Cause that's the one time that they're interested. It's then in the Royal rumble and you know, they'll be like, this must've been a, like a bitch to put together in the back. Like it's weird because you would yeah you would think so right just because there's so many people and she's like mm-hmm. ca- pure chaos from the you know from the get go, but um, it's not too bad really when you get down to it because at the end of the day it's you know it's like the Royal Rumble it's like anything you just gotta know when you gotta know when you're out it's it's like, it's mm-hmm. just like following the time when you gotta know when 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 your turn is and how <laughs> you're gonna do it if if there is a specific way it's usually. There's usually nothing too involved um, unless there's a specific story you're trying to tell. Like, we, hey, this person has to be eliminated by their tag team partner because we're trying to build a story there, right? Or mm-hmm. X, Y, Z. Um, and usually a lot of that stuff doesn't happen until you break down to the last, you know, the ring clears a little bit, right? Until we yeah. get to those last eight or last four, then you really start telling the deep stories and stuff. So before that, it's just kind of getting the numbers of who's in and who's out and planning some fun ways to get eliminated or stay in, whatever have you. So it's, it's chaotic, but it's not as hard as you'd think. And by the way, in an unrelated note, you're obviously a big whiskey guy. Is it like, is it offensive that I'm only drinking Jameson? Like such a, a basic, like a basic bitch whiskey. I mean, you're a no, real whiskey no, no. guy. Is it, no, is it, it annoying to you that I went, I went, Oh, this guy drinks whiskey. I'll just pour the most generic whiskey I can find into this glass <laughs> and drink it. No, it's not like I, I there were pro- there's probably a little part of me that would have been like really just me. <laughs> but uh, but like we go to the, we have the same argument over here like with America with our bourbon, you know, yeah. and that's my that's my favorite whiskey of choice. But where people will look down at like like a, a Jim Beam or an Evan Williams, which is which is kind of low tier or very yeah. intro level uh whoop, there we go. Uh very intro level whiskey, but at the heart of the day, if you, I always say, if you're a whiskey fan, you drink what you like and you drink it how you like it. I don't care if you drink it with Coke or with ice cubes or whatever. Um, yeah, there's no judgment. Enjoy <laughs> it however you like. No, for sure. I, I definitely, like, I got to be honest, I like Conor McGregor's whiskey. Uh, like, I, I, know that that's really? a, I know that's a controversial opinion, but I think, that I, I think that maybe I'm not a whiskey fan. I think that maybe I like it for the aesthetics. I think that that's why uh-huh. I like his whiskey because – when I drink, um, when I drink like beer or whatever, I'll always go for cider. I'll never drink a beer because I like it sweeter. I like it to taste as little like there's alcohol in it as possible. Sure. You know? um, I definitely, uh, I don't really, I like drinking, but I don't like, I don't love the taste of any drinks yet. I guess I'm only 22. Okay. So like, I don't know if it, if it'll come. Like I hear that that's what happens, but as of right now, it's I still love it, my it, ciders. The cliche, yeah, is about like what they call an inquired taste, you know. <laughs> I never understood it until, and so I started doing this whiskey stuff, and I really like. I had to force myself. To say, I, I I had to treat whiskey like a workout. It was yeah. like I had to get my reps in. I had to train myself up to before I was probably drinking whiskey straight for <laughs> six eight months, like regularly <laughs> before before I started actually like being the mm, high and mighty like oh I'm tasting this and oak and cherries and. Um, 
doing all that stuff. It took like, I literally just had to like get myself used to drinking it. And then just like, okay, does it not taste like a fireball in my mouth anymore? <laughs> I had to get past that point before I could actually start like getting into the nerdy aspects of it. It does. It takes a while and some dedication. What I would always try to do when I'm on a night out is, you know, that song, one bourbon, one scotch, one beer. He makes it sound so fun. I don't know that, yeah. that my friends, I found it great fun, but I don't know that my friends found it to be so fun when I would try that. Well, yeah, <laughs> when you do, but I think it depends on how you do it. Because if you do it, <laughs> one bourbon, one scotch, one beer, yeah, you're starting, you're setting yourself up for a rough night pretty quick. But just, just space it out. Who was the most fun to go partying with, go drinking with in the WWE locker room? Oh, this is going to, like, this is disappointing because I do not have a lot of party stories because I've never been a huge party guy. Yeah. I didn't go out on, like, on the road, man. I, like, the longest Only man, you were married young enough. Yeah. Yeah, man, like, and even in, so I, the only time thing I can tell you would be, like, in the FCW days when I was still a, a young single developmental chap in, uh, in Tampa, <laughs> I would go out with the guys from time to time. Uh, CJ, CJ Parker, again, Juice Robinson was super fun to go out with. We, you would bar hop up and down. Uh, there was one, sh- one area of Tampa called Soho, a couple of bars that we'd go to, um, that were kind of the regular haunts for all yeah. the guys. And again, nothing crazy, just, just fun nights out, just having laughs with, with the guys and, um, and getting, getting food, getting burritos at three in the morning and stuff like that. That's but, the best part of yeah. the night out for me when I oh, get to yeah. eat all my junk food at the end. <laughs> because um, there's nothing else in the world that tastes better it's no, incredible of course bro I, I my my meal of choice would always be like a big dirty like kfc meal like right before i go to bed right like, uh, like oh. 4 a.m and we get these like we get these crappy like buses home at four in the morning and there's disgusting people it's awesome it's amazing yeah that's what i'm looking forward to most about being back in ireland because we didn't have that in new york new york is alive like at 4 a.m that's like early in the night for them uh yeah. but I was in Florida in, in the end of January during Super Bowl week. I was in Miami. And it strikes me as like the, a great fun place for the, the three days I was there, but not the oh, place yeah. to live. So, I, in Florida, um, I, remember, I do remember hating it at first. <laughs> so coming, coming from Chicago, but, um, which gets very warm, but like we have super cold winters and stuff like this. I was, I was a more northern mm-hmm. Midwest kid. And coming to Florida where it's constantly hot, like I sweated through my sheets for the first like three, four weeks. Like, yeah. and I had the, I had the air conditioning down low and I was, <laughs> I was just like, Oh, it was humid. And like, it felt like it was nothing but like strip malls. And I feel like, Oh, like what, it, what is this place? It's too hot. It's too sunny. Uh, but at, by the end of it, especially in like, I found like my places, especially like even in Orlando uh, was super, I found a super pretty, neighborhood to, to live in and everything mm-hmm. like that so florida really grew on me and it can be a lot of fun bro it was it was difficult man because like i was going out to the bars and it was fun but i was also the the heat was killing me like i'm a pasty like i'm super pasty you can't even see it on the camera i'm like so pale it was it was difficult bro. like i'd go out to the beach and i'd have to come in like 10 minutes later because it was uh oh yeah it was so warm Oh, but I mean, like I said, that's the one thing from, you know, my Irish grandparents that I definitely inherited <laughs> with, the, with the pasty. I, I have to put sunscreen out in winter just, just, when the, just when the sun is out because if it's bright enough. Now, especially that I have this, I got to protect this. Um, yeah, it's, I would have to, like, if we ever went to the beach, you can ask my wife. I'd, I would swim in the water for five minutes, come back out, and spray myself <laughs> down with more yeah. sunscreen. I'm so, like petrified of getting burnt and looking especially when i'm on it was on tv oh yeah you know, it wouldn't be possible. i didn't want some farmer's tan or some bright red and can you uh, imagine taking a chop when you've got a big sunburned chest so oh. actually that's that's probably one story i do have it was an nxt loop we were in columbus ohio we were doing those nxt road shows right at the very beginning and i remember it was it was part of the bod villains because we were wrestling blake and murphy that night and I, I, we got, I had the whole day, so I'd gone to the gym, I'd gotten some lunch, and I wanted to walk around, like, the historic part of Columbus. And so I did, and I was wearing my tank top from the gym. And it wasn't that, what sucked was it was not that warm out, mm-hmm. but it was sunny. And so it was, like, something like 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So it felt cool, and I was walking around, and, yeah, this is great, uh, history and all this stuff. So I go back to my hotel, we get ready, we go to the show, I take my shirt off to get changed, and the tank oh, no. top 
is all white. I am red down my arms, shoulder, and back. And I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> and so Buddy Murphy looks at like looks at me, he's like, bro, you gotta take one of these. And there was a big <laughs> thing in NXT. If you, you take niacin, which is just which is just a, a B vitamin, but you can get you can just get it at the grocery store, you can get it in concentrated quantities. And it'll make your skin tingle and flush. And mm -hmm. a lot of guys thought it would, it kind of enhanced your tan because it right. kind of gave you this reddish flush. Which is a big deal in pro wrestling, the tan. Oh, yeah. But I never took it because I'm like, I'm sure. white as hell. I don't want to look like a cherry bomb. You, Seamus, and Paige didn't, oh, yeah. <laughs> didn't really care too much about it. No. And so, uh, but on that night, I took like 1,500 milligrams of niacin <laughs> and, uh, Luckily, between that and under like those bright stage lights, I watched the video back, and you really couldn't tell. I just looked as pasty as always. So, so thankfully, it didn't come across too bad. But it was it was a scary couple of moments there. One of the things I loved about living in New York was getting to go to theater so much. I would go to, to musical theater, uh, off Broadway shows. Obviously, Broadway is too expensive. I wouldn't go to that so much. But uh, do you think you'll ever tread the boards again? God, I would love to. You know, um, I've thought about that a lot. I mean, obviously, you know, wrestling and entertainment and everything. So, like, acting and with my background, I'd love to get into that. So, I've, I've been talking with, like, agents and things like that, putting, mm -hmm. putting feelers out for there. But that, of course, for, like, film and television and everything. But I, I do. I, I mean, I really wanted to do it in WWE. I wanted to, like, try to see if I could work something out. Like, especially when I was doing the Drama King, I'm like, hey, let me take, like, six weeks off do a play in New York or something and have oh, like bro. dot com follow me around as I rehearsed and then did the show and stuff. I'm like, like it was Elias like, a little bit where he would do concerts and they would have yeah, the people like follow him around. Cross promotion and like we could like we appeal to like theater fan, like culture people. You want to get more like yeah. cultured people watching wrestling? I'm like, let's do this little crossover thing. Do they but, want more cultured people watching wrestling? I do. Because <laughs> I think as I because I consider myself Re at least relatively cultured, or at least I can fake it enough. And I think there is that is as crazy and off the wall as some of our storylines and everything are, and they are. Um, there, I think there is something to be appreciated just from a performance art standpoint. And actually, one of the shows that I worked on before I got hired it was there is a play called The Elaborate Entrance of Chad Deity, and mm -hmm. it's written by an incredible playwright named Christopher Diaz out of New York City. Um, and, but it debuted in Chicago and I got to work on the play, helping them figure out the wrestling. But it's about, it's a play that takes place in the world of like, of pro wrestling, kind of like a mock WWE situation. Oh, wow. And, but it focuses all on the issues of like, of like race and how we portray certain, you know, races and like socioeconomic things in, in media and all this stuff. Heavy subject really matter considering, yeah. you know, how race is addressed in professional wrestling. Right, and, and which is kind of a microcosm of how race and everything is addressed in media in general mm -hmm. in our society. So it was a really good play, and it eventually went off-Broadway in New York and popped up all over the country in various theaters. But if, if people just seek it out in general, it's a really – that, and that's kind of helped me realize, wow, there is a lot to kind of look at and dive into in professional wrestling, more than I think most people give it credit for. Absolutely, and I think that that's one of the – the barriers that hasn't been broken down. You know, The Rock is the most famous movie star. Brock Lesnar was the most famous MMA fighter. We've seen, you know, boxers come in and out of, of pro wrestling. We've got Anthony Agogo from the Olympics coming to AEW. Um, we've never had the, the wrestler break into the theater. And it's a, like, it's a tough industry. I went to a show in New York where they had a, a social media influencer playing. Um, I went to see Mean Girls, the musical. And they had a social media influencer playing one of the main characters. And people hated it. They thought it was terrible. And I thought, I thought he wasn't that bad. I mean, he, was, like, he wasn't at Broadway level, but I understood sure. what they were doing. And, uh, and I, like, I think that that's the, like, one of the last borders that wrestlers have to break down, right? Getting into, into theater on a, on a high level in Broadway or in the West End. Hey, I, I, am, <laughs> I am ready, willing, and able. And, uh, and, and would be, yeah, I think that'd be super cool. I love that idea. Is there any shows in particular you would like to be in? Oh my God. Um, I've always had, I mean, there's a million, there's a million to be in. I, there, the two, one musical and one straight play. Uh, and they're kind of obvious answers, but I don't care because I love them. 
I've always wanted to be Javert in Les Miserables. Right. Uh, just one, because the role is generally baritone. And so I can't hit the, any of the other roles. But, uh, <laughs> and I just, I love that kind of a tortured character. And then I love David Mamet plays. And so uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross I, is, of course. I think, an awesome, awesome show. And what I love about that show, and I think they are doing it more now, is originally it's written as ba- it's, it's, and the movie was made too as what it's it's five or six you know white men in, in real estate mm-hmm. but the roles as written can be anyone they could be any race they could be any gender and so i love the, the casting options that a show like Glenn Gary glenn ross could do because you could have you could have about five black women playing the lead roles and it would still yeah. work just because because of the way that it's written and everything like that and so uh that's a that's a show i would love to be a part of no, for sure. I think it's a, that's definitely the macho answer that like if, if a guy is asked like what play would you like to be in and they have to like come across, you know, the most uh, manly as possible, they would say Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Like that's the, the right, obvious yeah. choice. That's, and which I know I feel like I said, like an easy answer, a cliche answer, especially for a dude. My other one, which is also kind of a cliche dude answer is, uh, is a Martin McDonough play, uh, yeah. something like Pillow Man or something like that. Lonesome West. I love his stuff is awesome. Uh, very much too. I always loved his stuff. What sort of stuff were you in when you were in college? College? Um, so I went to a school called Columbia College, Chicago. We had, I did a few plays that were like, I wouldn't call them experimental, but they were very, mm. very kind of avant-garde. There was one called uh, The Water Engine, which was very kind of like dreamlike almost. And uh, the other, oh, I did one my sophomore year, but for the life of me, I can't remember the name of it. I was playing like this rotten husband uh, mm-hmm. to, to, the, to the main character who was like kind of going slowly, like going mad and like kind of weaving in and out of all these like crazy, like dreamscape scenarios. And I was like her awful husband. <laughs> um, but uh, sounds like a perfect role cool. for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it was cool because uh, most of the stuff I did was in, was in these smaller, like, black box theaters that we had at the school. And yeah. uh, so to, to do theater like that, which I think is very cool and very important, was a lot of fun. Bro, it's, it's definitely, like, it's awesome to watch. My sister did a, a course in theater, so I would go to these, like you say, black box theater shows all the time. And like you said, very experimental, very, like, you know, it, it's not like people are doing, you know, Grease and all these sort of yeah. uh, traditional, like, theater shows and stuff and it definitely uh it and it, it can help in in what you do in pro wrestling too like it can develop your your skill in in that regard right yeah 100 percent. so like performance there's so many parallels if you want to think about it so black box theater is a lot like independent wrestling right you you have less resources to work with you have uh you have less resources to work with but you got to make it work somehow you got to make a show tell a story that engrosses that audience just because you don't have as many lights or as many props and everything. And then you go to like radio city music hall or, you know, or Royal Albert Albert hall or something like that. And you have this, you can have this big production. You can do full scale musicals. That's kind of like WWE. Mm -hmm. You, um, you have all the bells and whistles, but what I like about either way, at the end of the story, the performers on stage or in the ring need to be telling a story that connects with people. But then, so I just love those parallels. I heard on Chris Van Vliet's show, you played an Irish guy in a show before, right? Yeah, my first ever play. Oh, um, wow. What was that? It was called Translations by Brian Friel. Mm. And um, yeah, my friend had committed, he's like, at the beginning of the season, he's like, hey, I, I, also, I think you'd be good, have fun acting. You should try out for the plays this year. And I was like, okay. So I tried out. I got the lead role in this play. Um, and the first ever show I'd ever done, I had to do two dialects. I had to do an Irish dialect because the whole story based on was about this Irish guy translating to like the old school Irish people who still yeah. spoke traditional Gaelic and Irish. Yeah. And so I was speaking English, but I had to switch between a brogue and an English dialect, like translating to people back and forth. And I'd never even acted before. So... It was a heavy task, but I loved it so much. And it had such a lot of my friends, uh, gained a lot of really good friends from that cast. And the, the respect that I gained from, from listening to my sister and my dad has done some acting as well, like from, you know, doing these productions, it is so difficult. Like it is, 
any live production, like you've been doing it for your whole adult life, right? Between theater and, and then professional wrestling, like this shit is hard. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it does take, it takes a certain level of gumption. I mean, to, to kind of get up there in front of audiences, big and small. And to be fair, the smaller ones are way harder than the bigger ones. Oh, when you can see your family in the front, in, in, in like the, the second row, forget about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, if you can, we used to think, as, back in the FCW days and early NXT days, some of those Florida house shows were, were literally 10 people. And so, like, the kind of thing, if you can get those 10 people who were sitting in a bright, lit room, like, it's not even dark because, like, the, the VFW hall can't turn the lights off and everything. Because <laughs> that's, like, when it's light, people don't want to stand up and share. They want, they, they're very reserved when everyone else can see them. But it's, so if you can get 10 people in a brightly lit VFW hall to go to cheer and everything like that, then you can get 60,000 in an arena to cheer. Like it's, it's this weird reverse psychology, but it works. Right. Last one for me. If you could choose which one, uh, let's say you got offered a reasonable level movie, like a decent, like we're not talking about like The Rock, but you know, a decent movie. We're not talking about a WWE productions film either. Uh, you get one of those or a show off Broadway or like a three month run in WWE, but that's going to be it. Like, you know, it's going to be a, a rolling three month contract. You're, you're going to get the, the U S title for a month and we're going to put over some new guy from NXT. Which of those three would you choose? That's really hard. It would depend. I mean, I'm so I, it would gotta be the movie or the theater just cause that's something new. And I want, I yeah. would love a new challenge. It depends to which, I don't know, man. It's, I'm, I'm a big guy on story. I would have to read the scripts. Um, I think honestly, I think honestly, I would take the play. Yeah, I think just because there's something, it would it'd be this nice bridge because I would still be doing it in front of a live audience, different atmosphere than wrestling, of course, but it's being able to inhabit a different character, a uh, new challenge, still getting that feeling, a little bit of that energy from the audience, and uh, yeah, depending on the story, I, Do I would have love the theater agents. What's that? Do you have agents that will try to get you like on stage roles as opposed to, you know, like I know that all wrestlers pretty much have like film agents and stuff that will get you in, or a lot of people do anyway. Your face tells me not, really? but do, do you uh, have, I, don't, I know, I know about, I know about three people who actually have <laughs> quote unquote agents. I don't have an agent of any kind, but you're, you're looking into it. I'm looking, yes. I'm looking into it at the moment. Yes. And usually if you can get an agent, usually they're pretty good, like in the acting industry. They, they kind of cover everything. Um, they might have specialists who help them find roles in film and find roles in theater, but usually they'll cover getting you booked wherever. Matt, I would like to thank you so much for your time. Uh, I hope that everyone who's watched this enjoys uh, whiskey because they're going to have to head over to Wrestling With Whiskey on YouTube right after this. They're going to have to head over to Drama King Matt on Instagram and on Twitter. Anything else you want to plug? No, I mean, just open and available for anything. I appreciate you guys having me out. WrestlingWithWhiskey at gmail.com for any inquiries or bookings or anything. And uh, I'm ready to take on the world. Matt, thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you.